Mr. Savage, I must ask you yet again to make it clear to your client that I am prepared to try him here and now for contempt and to pass a consecutive sentence unless he remains silent while sentence is passed. I am extremely sorry, Your Honor. Whilst in no way condoning his behavior, I can only ask the court to take into consideration the stress he has taken. Your Honor, Mr. Justice oh, Bloody Edward Dawlish, he's then interested in justice as he showed joining in something up. That's it. Take him below. Get the hands off me. Get your bloody hands off me. Order in the court. I'll Silence. see them with you. Order in court. I take it that you have no objection to my passing sentence in his absence, Mr. Savage? As your honor pleases. As I was saying, members of the jury, your verdict is one with which I heartily concur. Thomas Roger Snaith betrayed his position of trust by systematically milking his employers of over £30,000 over a period of seven years. He cared nothing for the well-being of his firm and less for the security of its 30 employees whom his insatiable greed has placed in jeopardy. In view of this, and bearing in mind that £10,000 is still unaccounted for, most probably smuggled out of the country, I am sentencing him to a term of imprisonment of nine years. Vendetta for a Judge. A new play for radio by James Follett, with Bernard Horsfall and Mary Law as Edward and Caroline Dawlish, and Roger Hammond and Frieda Dowie as Tom and Marion Snaith. Vendetta for a Judge. Nine years. Nine years on the say so of a bent judge. So paid him. It was obvious to everyone that he was lying. Don't be stupid, Tom. And keep your voice down. He should have told the jury in his summing up. The evidence of a bookmaker of Slope's record is not to be trusted. He should have said... Nine years. Slope hasn't got a record. Too bloody cunning. As cunning as that judge's bent. Oh. How long will the appeal take, Tom? Baker doesn't know. The useless solicitor he turned out to be. It's no good blaming everyone else, Tom. You were swindled Hutchings Engineering out of that money and you got caught. You brought everything on yourself. I used to hear a wife sticking by her husband. I'm going to stick by you for the next nine years. Unless you'd like me to find someone else. I'm sorry, Marion Love. It's just that it wouldn't be nine years if it hadn't been for that judge. Mr. Baker said that Judge Dawlish is the best and the fairest circuit judge in the country. It's not his fault if Slope lied about the amount of money you bet with him over the years. Slope's book showed. Slope's book showed what Slope wanted them to show. I'm not blaming Slope, not with taxation being what it is. I, what I'm saying is that Dawlish should have warned the jury that it's not unknown for backstreet bookies to keep two sets of books. Oh, I know. Turf accountant. <laughs> Even Harry Slope blinked at the saint-like aura of respectability that damn judge gave him. Is there still 10,000 unaccounted for? Not a cent. Slope had it. If only you hadn't wasted it on the horses like that. I paid off the mortgage, didn't I? New car. All those holidays abroad. I didn't hear you complaining. I didn't know, Tom. Of course you did. Tom, I swear. I had no idea. But you must have suspected. Did you really think that I was worth that sort of salary to Hutchings? Yes. Y yes, Tom, I did. Well, I was a good company secretary. I only took what a good company secretary is entitled to. Five thousand a year on top of their lousy pay. I mean, I wasn't greedy. I've saved them a hundred times that over the years by toning down some of young Hutchings harebrained schemes. They should have put me on the board when the old man died. Twenty-five years I slogged my guts out for that firm. And they wouldn't even give me a car. I was entitled. I was prepared to give them my entire life. The least they should have given me was some sort of future. Well, there's not much of a future for us now, is there? Or his honour, Judge Edward Bloody Dawlish. What do you mean? 
I'm going to fix him. Just as he fixed me. Oh, don't talk silly. I'm serious, Marion. I'm going to ruin that judge's life just as he's ruined ours. I don't know how, but I'll think of something. After all, I've got plenty of time, haven't I? Plenty of time. Nine bloody years. According to the paper, the trial went well. Huh? Thomas Roger Snaith Edward, who gave him nine years yesterday. Sir? Well, so what went wrong? Who said anything went wrong? Oh, Edward. After 20 years, and you still can't credit me with the ability to read the signs. The new issue of Turf and Tote is at your elbow, and you've not looked at it. When you got home last night, you didn't want to watch the last episode of the Dick Francis serial. In bed, you ignored me. Uh, well, and you've I... been too preoccupied to notice my existence this morning. Two things can go wrong on circuit for you, the hotel or the hearing. I've visited the Royal at Stanley several times, and the service has always been superb. Therefore, it must have been the trial. <laughs> Oh, I should know better than to try to hide something from you, Caroline. So something did go wrong. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, or I'll put out your check suit for Sandow. Oh, no, no, not, uh, <laughs> not the check suit, no. <laughs> Jockey clubs threaten me with a red card if I wear that again to a meeting. <laughs> so what was it then? Oh, well, it's... Well, it's just that the trial wasn't as smooth as I like my trials to be. Uh, Bagley prosecuting? Yes. Yeah. And savage leading for the defence? Yes. Don't tell me that silks of their calibre gave you a bad time. No, 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 of course not. And there was no legal wrangling before an empty jury box, and you didn't have to direct the jury on a majority verdict. It says here that they were out for less than 15 minutes. And the evidence against Snape was irrefutable. If you read on, you'll see that there were several outbursts from the dock. In the end, I had to pass sentence on Snape in his absence. And that's what's upset you? I suppose so. Oh, rubbish. There was McQueen last year and Phillips the year before. Oh, then there was that character who threatened you with his business associates before the police dragged him out of the dock. I may have overstepped the mark in my summing up. Swayed the jury? Possibly. But you said the evidence was irrefutable. He fiddled 30,000 and you gave him nine years. It would have been seven. I tagged on two years because 10,000 hadn't been accounted for. But still less than the maximum sentence, Edward. It was a mild-looking, bespectacled, clerical-grade civil servant type. The sort of man you'd expect to have a loving wife, a mortgage on a semi, neat flower beds in his front garden, and a family saloon in the garage that he cleans every Sunday morning. Oh. And yet... Yes? He, he sat quietly in the dock all through the trial. Not even looking up when new witnesses were sworn in. He remained like that until his bookmaker gave evidence for the prosecution. From then onwards, there was a complete transformation. He interrupted the bookmaker, Slope, half a dozen times, saying that Slope was lying. And then he interrupted my summing up when I came to Slope's evidence. Was his evidence essential to the prosecution? Oh, no. No, Bagley had already built up a convincing case that Snape had taken the money. And he called Slope because he wanted to establish that Snaith hadn't spent all the money as the defence were trying to prove, but that Snaith still had about 10,000 sold it away somewhere. Which Bagley successfully proved and which earned Snaith an extra two years. So what? It was the hatred for me that blazed out of Snaith's eyes before I had him sent below. Suddenly he wasn't the mild-mannered, bespectacled clerk. In that moment, at that exact moment, time suddenly seemed to stand still for a thousand years. And I found myself staring into the eyes of the devil. Left, right, left, right, left, right, halt! Up straight, Snaith. Feet together, hands at side, eyes straight ahead. Straight, I said. You'll address Mr. Drummond as Sir Governor or Mr. Drummond, understand? Uh, yes. You arrival, Sir Thomas Roger Snaith. Thank you, Mr. Brunt. You may be, Mr. Sir. Uh, take a seat, Snaith. Thank you, Governor. Oh, welcome to Tower Mills Prison, Snaith. An institution for rehabilitated criminals about to re-enter the outside world and first offenders who have just left it. Men from opposite sides of the spectrum, so to speak, and yet the system works remarkably well. 
we find that the old hands provide a cautionary warning to the newcomers. Now, this is an excellent report from the prison where you were held on remand. It's a promising start, Snape. I started the way I intend to go on, Governor. Well, I'm pleased, Snape. Very pleased. We find that most prisoners at Tower Mills usually earn their full remission of one-third of their sentence. Now, your sentence was... Uh, uh, nine years. Well, carry on as you have been. You'll be out in six. You've an appeal pending? Uh, yes, Governor. Hmm. Well, you'll be allowed to see your legal advisers in private at any reasonable time. My policy is firmness, administered with compassion. It's a flexible policy. So flexible that it can be applied to or withdrawn from individual prisoners according to their behavior. You're, um, you're an accountant. Uh, yes, Governor. Oh. You know, we don't get many accountants in here. Too honest, I suppose, or too clever. <laughs> Except in your case, eh? <laughs> well, that's a stroke of luck for us. We run a market garden. You know, a small farm. It's now a part of the prison. I saw the glass houses from the van, Governor. It looks a well-run operation. It is, Smith. It even makes a small profit. The trouble is the paperwork's in a bit of a mess. Receipts, invoices... I'd be delighted to help out. Why, come, make you, of course. I don't want you to feel that you're under any sort of pressure. Oh, no, really, Governor. I'd be delighted to help in any way I can. Oh, splendid. Well, that's settled. There's a small office attached to the storage shed that you can use. I'll tell Mr. Brunt that you'll be taking the paperwork worries off his shoulders. Um, of course, you won't actually be handling money. I'd rather not anyway, Governor. Yeah. Uh, it's just the question of your room. We don't like to call them cells. I'm putting you in with Charles Fox. He used to be quite a rogue in his day. He's being released in six months, so he won't mind sharing. Well, thank you, Governor. Well, good luck then, Snape. Continue in your present attitude. I'm sure we shall get on well together. You know, my dear, it never ceases to amaze me how a member of the Carthage family, with their long history of staying out of kitchens, should have mastered the culinary arts as you have. This cheesecake is delicious. Actually, Dad, it came out of a packet. Oh. <laughs> a housewife should never confess. The burden of proof must constitutionally rest with the recipients of her wares. Did you really drag me away from London merely to sample some frightful convenience food you found mouldering on a supermarket shelf? I wanted to talk to you about Edward. Edward. Isn't it always about Edward? What is it this time? His summer colds, a new allergy. Oh, Dad. You know, my dear, it was a mistake you two not having children. Something other than Edward for you to worry about. You know perfectly well that we wanted children. I'm an offensive old man, my dear. I wouldn't blame you if you slung me out. All right, what's on your mind? <sighs> Edward hasn't been sleeping or eating properly. It started last week after he'd sentenced some swindler for defrauding his firm. Snaith, I read the report. What about it? <sighs> Something about the trial has upset Edward. What? <sighs> he won't say. Then how do you know it's the Snaith trial that's upset him? Because I know him. And besides, he made some comment about Snaith's behavior. Normally, he hardly ever discusses in case unless he's got a long judgment to write. Hmm. I suppose he's at the Sandown meeting. Yes. You will talk to him when he gets back, won't you? When does he get back? About seven. Well, I've got to be back at the House of Lords about four. Do you think he's worried in case he's misdirected the jury? What's happened to your unshakable confidence in his ability? Which you share, Dad. Oh, I would not have recommended his appointment to Her Majesty as the youngest circuit judge in the country if I thought it likely that he would go misdirecting juries. Where does he keep his judge's notebook? In his den? When he always keeps his desk locked. Good Lord. What's the matter? There must be every edition of turf and tote here for the past ten years. Well, he likes to keep them. Uh, and what's this? Oh, that's his racehorse card index. One card for every horse. Parentage, trainers, wins, everything. A full history on virtually every racehorse in the world. Good Lord. Well, I knew he liked his racing, but this... And his, his racing books outnumber his law books. Oh, so what? He's got all the law books he needs. And besides, I like him to have an outside interest. It benefits his career. But, but my dear child, this isn't an interest. It's an obsession. Oh, don't be silly, Dad. 
Does he bet heavily? He'll have a few bets at Sandown this afternoon and lose about three pounds. That's his average. He spends a lot less on horses than you do on drink. Is that what he tells you? Three pounds per meeting? We have a joint bank account. If he was spending more, I'd know about it. And we don't have secrets. Except that he's not telling you what's been worrying him. Well, that's different. So our public attitudes to gambling from what they were 20 years ago. And what's that supposed to mean? Are you still as ambitious for Edward as you used to be? Well, you know the answer to that. I want Edward to reach the top. And he will, my dear. He's young by the standards of our profession. He's extremely competent and he's popular. I've no doubt that he'll be appointed to the High Court within seven years. A High Court judge before he's 50. And after that? Well, who knows? But? But all this racing journals. Card indexes and so on could have an adverse effect on his career. I not say it will, but it could have. I thought racing was the sport of kings. Well, unlike judges, kings are above the law and they're not appointed. Oh, don't be ridiculous. What possible damage to Edward's career can a mild flutter now and then do? Well, it's a reminder that Edward is human. The public doesn't want to know what judges are, but they definitely aren't human. And if they are, I mustn't show it. <laughs> Judges are creatures that wear funny clothes, which, like trees, change colours with the seasons. Their natural habitat is the courtroom. They've never heard of punk rock, the <laughs> Rolling Stones, or the Beatles. They live on a diet of facetious counsels. They don't drink or drive fast cars or copulate. <laughs> and they most certainly don't bet on horses. You do say some ludicrous things, Dad. Oh, maybe. But being a political animal, I've learned to sense when the wind's going to change. And change soon in public attitude towards gambling, just as it has changed towards sex. Fifty years ago, no one minded if a cabinet minister had a mistress. Today, they're kept under surveillance by the special branch to make sure they don't. Oh. For people in public life, the so-called permissive society doesn't exist. If you're still as ambitious for Edward as you used to be, it's up to you to persuade him to moderate his interest in racing. It's a weakness. A weakness? What's that, Squire? Uh, I'm just thinking aloud, Foxy. Wondering if judges have weaknesses. How many eggs from your row? Oh, uh, twenty dozen. Bleak nangs. Governor's got a weakness for blaming me when they're not laying proper. Reckons I'm not feeding them right. I mean, how can you feed them not right, eh? He just loads their mash into the automatic feeders, and they just help themselves from the troughs. Poor creatures shut up in cages like this all their lives. Too stupid to know they're alive, chickens. Had a woman MP nosing round last year, made a fuss because we weren't locked up. And she come in here and made another fuss because the chickens were. People. We all have our idiosyncrasies, Foxy. Oh, what? Inconsistencies. <laughs> Weaknesses. Oh. It's a funny thing. Whenever somebody like you educated on that, gets to be looked after by Her Majesty. He always turns out to be an accountant or something. How did you do it? I mean, 30 G's, big league stuff. Simple, really. I set up a company that invoiced my company automatically each month for goods and services provided. So what's illegal about that, then? Well, no goods and services were provided. Ah. Oh. The company I set up existed only on paper. The names and addresses of the directors were fictitious. Its only assets were a post office box number to receive the monthly check. What you wrote? Yes. Clever. For a short time, yes. For a long time, stupid. Any of it left? The judge thought so. Which is why the bastard gave me nine years. Who was it? His honour, Judge Edward Dawlish. Crawley Dawley? No. I'd say I know Crawley. Fifteen year ago, he defended me on a dock brief. Young, I'd say. Green as Epping Forest. But he got me off. Five year ago, I'm in court again, and who should be in the eye chair but Crawley Dawley? I was so shattered, I nearly pleaded guilty. Why is he called Crawley? Why do you call him a bastard, then? Because that's what he is. Yeah. The new ones always blame the judge. He's made the jury against me. They say that as well. <laughs> Look, Squire. Take my tip. <laughs> You're on appeal, so let your lawyers worry about what the judge said or did. Lawyers won't do what I intend doing to Dawlish, Foxy. Uh, what's that, Squire? I intend to destroy him utterly, to wreck his career, his whole life. And I'll do it legally, when I've discovered his Achilles heel. 
a tough old Achilles. I tell you how he come by that handle cruelly, cause he married right. Mind you, I've heard that it was her that made a set for him, but he got called cruelly and it stuck. He married Lord Carthage's daughter. And you know who Lord Carthage is now? Just the name rings a bell. Does a sight more than that old son. Lord Carthage is the Lord Chancellor, the boss of all the judges himself. So you can see why you best think again. Wrong, Foxy. It'll make the task that much more interesting. <laughs> and infinitely more rewarding. Company, come. Ah, Snake. I was told you were here. How are you getting on with the paperwork? I'm very sorry, Governor, but I've not been able to get into the office. Mr. Brunt went on leave without giving me the key. I specifically asked him to hand over before he left. Uh, all right, I'll unlock for you. How's the egg situation today, Fox? Uh, not 50 dozen, Mr. Drummond. Oh, damn birds. They're costing more to feed than the return we get on the eggs. And we're buying feed in bulk. Hardly any eggs are going into the prison kitchens because we have to meet our commitments to a local supermarket. Um, do you know anything about poultry farming, Smith? I'm afraid not, Governor, but uh, I can always learn. No one does, aren't you? We inherited this battery house when the Home Office acquired the farm. Oh, I don't mind to sell off these wretched birds. Use it for storage. Not a very cost-effective store, I would have thought, Governor. It's too big, and there must be a lot of capital tied up in the ventilation and heating equipment and the automatic cleaning. Oh. Well, uh, I'll think about it. I'll show you the office. And uh, you too, Fox. Yes, sir. You can help Slate carry it out. I dare say Mr. Brunt's left it in a mess. Ah, as I thought, a mess. Still, it'll keep you busy, Snaith. Oh, people's everywhere. No wonder Mr. Brunt can never find receipts. It's the sort of thing I've straightened out before, Governor. <laughs> Metal spike filing system and no proper books. Uh, I'll make a start on it now. Yes, yeah, stroke of luck you're coming here, Snaith. Well, for us, that is. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to it. Now lock up and bring me the key before the evening meal. Stupid fool. There's plenty of prison governors worse than drummer, Squire. And don't you let his nature fool you. He's a real tough when he wants. Blimey! I've not taken it out. Where is it? Hey, don't answer it, Squire. You'll lose privileges on that. What privileges? Well, just being in Tower Mill, Squire. If you've been in Durham or Albany, you know what I mean. Oh, you stupid twit. Yes? Brunt? Uh, yes. Castle here, Tower Mill Supermarket. We're exercising our right to cancel the contract if your flaming eggs fall below standard. Now, you have fair warning. Our customers' goodwill is more important than your good price eggs. Paper thin shells that crack if you look at them, incorrect grading, dirty boxes, and God knows what else. Yesterday's consignment is the final straw. What in hell's name do you think we can do with 50 dozen? We shift that many within 10 minutes of opening. You'll have to feed them to your inmates because I'm dumbed if I'm going to unload them on my customers anymore from next week. Good day to you. That drummer's going to have to get rid of the battery house after all. Who was it? The Tower Mill supermarket. They're not buying any more eggs. Yeah. You can't do that. You'll be crucified. Well, I'm doing it, aren't I? And no one's going to find out unless you tell them. You wouldn't do that, would you, Foxy? Now, leave me, please. Of course I won't, Grass. But you're mad. You could have a nice soft number here. All right, I'm going. Hello, Marion. Guess who? Tom! How are you keeping them? Tom! It is you! Of course it's me, silly. Oh! But I didn't think you'd be allowed to make calls. Oh! Oh, Tom. It's so good to hear your voice. I've missed you terribly. I've missed you, love. I'm coming to visit you tomorrow. No, you mustn't. Now, don't visit me, for God's sake. We'll see each other, love, I, I promise, but I, I don't want you visiting me. I don't want the screws here seeing you as my wife. You're picking up the words, Tom. You said you wouldn't. Well, you're picking up more than that if I can work out some sort of plan. Now, listen carefully. I don't know how long I'll be able to talk. I want you to put the house on the market. <laughs> now, just listen. Have the house valued and sell it. You've got power of attorney, so there shouldn't be any problems. It'll be snapped up immediately. You know how they're selling. Then move up here into a Tower Mills hotel under your maiden name while you're looking round for somewhere else. Oh, that'll be nice, Tom. I want to be near you. 
Now, sell the car and buy a large van, a transit or a comma, something like that. Buy it in your maiden name. Yes. Take it to a sign writer and have him paint T and M Trading on both sides and the back. No company or limited, just T and M Trading. Have you got that? Yes. But why, Tom? Oh, I'm not 100% sure myself just yet, but just do it. See Johnny Felton about an accommodation address, then find a small printer and have him run off a hundred... Coffee for you, Edward. Huh? Oh, thank you, darling. Yes. Just what I needed. Difficult judgment? Uh, worst imaginable. That patent's infringements business. Oh, luckily I adjourned until the end of the month, so there's no hurry. But this is the slave's indictment, Edward. Huh? And the trial transcript. Oh, no, yes, it was typed up because it'll be needed by the Court of Appeal. But why have you got a copy? If you've granted an appeal certificate, it's out of your hand. Yeah, well, the shorthand writer was new, and I thought I'd just take a look at it while it's still fresh in my mind. Just in case. It's still worrying you, isn't it? Tell me about it. I walked past the coach and horses at lunchtime today. It was full of juniors. Laughing and drinking. You didn't join them. No, I did not, but I was tempted. My God, I was tempted. It would be most unseemly. Well, Farlane does. And Kinsey. I doubt if Farber has them in mind as future puny judges. Caroline, have you been indulging in political manoeuvring? Well, Daddy mentioned to me that there was talk of increasing the strength of the Queen's bench. Ah. It would be a marvellous step up. Which I would rather not take. And if I did want to take it, then I'd want to take it without your help. You've got where you are on your own ability. With a little bit of help from your friend. I've never tried to influence Father. I haven't had to. He's the one who's always said that you'd go right to the top, the very top. It's what I want for you and what I want you to want. Yes, I didn't want to become a judge. I was perfectly happy in chambers. <laughs> well, you were so over the moon with excitement that I hadn't the heart to turn it down. Everyone's assumed responsibility for my ambitions. First, my father pushing me into law, when all I wanted in the world was to run the stud farm, and then you came along and convinced me that my lack of ambition was merely lack of self-confidence. And all this because of Snape? And all this is because I have sentenced a man to imprisonment for longer than he deserves. Because you didn't believe that bookmaker's evidence? I'm certain slow blind. I know that sort of bookie half a dozen addresses in as many years, always on the move. Daddy thinks that you know a little too much about bookmakers. He said he... Maybe I should have dropped a hint to the jury in my summing up. Why didn't you? <laughs> well, the prosecution established Slope's probity and the defence failed to take it. So what was I to say to the jury when I came to summarising Slope's evidence? Hmm? Suggest it was all a pack of lies because I just didn't like the look of the man's face? Well, the real prisoner in a courtroom isn't the man in the dock, darling, but the judge. Oh, no, yes, counsels can decide the line their case will take, and juries are perfectly free to return the most extraordinary verdicts and have to answer to no one but the judge. Everyone watches the judge and screams for his head if he's proved not to possess extrasensory perception. If I had the ability of a judge like Snowley or Edgar... I would have thought of a perfectly legitimate way of conveying my feelings about Slope to the jury. But... You do have the ability, darling. All you lack is the faith in yourself. I did have the ability to pick the right wife. <laughs> Where would I be without you, eh? Mm. Still messing about with counsel's opinions. Too nervous about poking my nose in a courtroom to be given decent briefs. You'd be where you are now, Edward. If you say so, my dear. We need a break. How about going down to Somerset for the weekend? Oh. I don't say you can't. Father's bought a new horse. Damn it, man, you had no right to go away, leaving that phone connected. But the post office... I am not interested in what the post office said. 
What concerns me is that there could have been a breach of security because you went on leave without removing the phone from the farm office which you knew I intended handing over to Smith. Uh, with respect, sir, it never occurred to me that you'd hand it over without checking it first. Hmm. Yeah, well, luckily no harm has been done. Snape said that he didn't know the phone was there. It was hidden under a lot of old farming newspapers. And you believed him, sir? Snape is turning out to be the best prisoner we've ever had. Look at these ledgers he's prepared. Hours he's put into them. Hours. Oh, you can return them to me. Sir. Uh, no. No, I'll take them down to him myself. I tell you this, Brunt. Snaith is obviously determined to earn his full remission. If he says he never used that phone, then I'm prepared to believe him. What do you say? Oh, good morning, sir. Here are your ledgers. They're superb, Snaith. They're absolutely first class. I often wonder how we used to manage without you. <laughs> Actually, sir, you didn't. Hmm? I'm just going over the VAT returns for the past nine months. I'm afraid Mr. Brunt has made a number of errors in farm account. Really? Nothing serious, I hope. Oh, minor things that can be put right on our next return. One of our largest outputs is fuel for the tractors and farm machinery. Hmm? Mr. Brunt has been claiming back VAT at the standard rate instead of 12.5%. Customs and excise errors... Forty-three pounds and ten pence. Oh, splendid, Snake. Uh, there is a couple of things, sir. Yes? Uh, the egg van driver tells me that he won't be collecting the eggs next week. Yes, the wretched supermarket are cancelling their contract. I had a letter from the manager yesterday. Why? Uh, the driver gave me this address and phone number. T&M Trading. Apparently, their firm have rented a stall in the Tower Mills covered market to sell local farm produce. Maybe they'd be interested in buying our eggs. I'm thinking of closing the battery house down. Which brings me to my second point, sir. I've been checking the figures and agree with you that the egg production is bad. Uh, with your permission, sir, I'd be grateful if you'd let me run the house for an experimental period, say, a month, uh, to see if I can improve things. Oh. Well, what do you know about poultry farming? <laughs> I've been reading all these books and magazines. Uh, uh, just for a month, sir. Uh. All right, then. It would help, sir, if you'd let Foxy help me and, uh, uh no one else. Huh? Uh, there's an article in one of these mags that says the fewer people allowed in a battery house, the better. It's here somewhere. It says that laying hens should be disturbed as little as possible. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter, Snaith. I'll take your word for it. Look, are you suggesting that you and Foxy take over the work of the cleaning parties as well? Yes, sir. Just the two of us allowed in the house. What? Not even prison officers? Oh, no, I... I can't have that, I'm sorry. It's not as if we'd be able to get up to anything, sir. Not in a battery house. <laughs> uh, just for a month, sir. A trial period. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's most irregular, Snaith. Hmm. All right, then. A month. And if there's no improvement, we'll revert to normal procedures. Understood? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. You contact T&M Trading, then? Yes, I'll call them immediately. I get them to send someone round, sir, and I'll do my best to negotiate a good price. You, you're ne <laughs> You've got a colossal cheek, Snape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all right. On your shoulders rests the entire responsibility for the success of the operation. It'll be a huge success, sir. I, I do promise you that. So T&M Trading have sent a woman, Mr. Brunt. Well, I did practice discrimination, so why can't I see her? You may be the governor's blue-eyed boy, Snaith, but the rules don't allow prisoners to see women alone. What rules, Mr. Brunt? Home office regulations, Sonny. I must read them sometime. See if they have anything to say about petrol intended for farming machinery disappearing into light blue coupés. <laughs> you want to see her in here? Oh, why not? It'd be nice and private. Miss Parsons, if you come in here, please. Oh, Miss Parsons, uh, please take a seat. Oh, thank you. Tea or coffee? Coffee? Uh, two coffees, please, Mr. Brunt, and uh, close the door behind you. Oh, oh. oh. darling. Oh, my love. Oh, darling. Oh, I know, sweetheart. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's been such a long time, Tom. It's terrible not being able to visit you. Why wouldn't you let me? Why did I have to stay Is that market stall fixed up? Yes, it's ready. Oh, Tom, 
It is lovely. Good, good. Now we haven't much time. Here's the price you're to offer for the eggs based on a daily collection of 50 dozen size threes unboxed. But surely that's too high, Tom. Which means that Drummond can't refuse it. But how are we going to... You saw that battery house. Yes. It's huge. Yes, it's big, all right. There's over 6,000 laying hens in there, except that they aren't laying. Not properly, anyway. Those birds were 12 weeks old when the prison bought the farm and took the battery house over. They're being fed on a grower's mash that wasn't changed to a layer's mash at 20 weeks. Consequently, the poor birds aren't receiving the correct diet to enable them to lay. There's no calcium for shell formation and so on. I've put 200 birds onto layers mash as an experiment, and they've been laying 175 eggs per day, nearly 15 dozen eggs. Yes, but I don't see what I'm As I gradually to... put all the birds onto layers mash, production will go up to 400 dozen eggs per day. Gosh. You will buy 50 dozen each day legitimately, but Foxy and I will load 300 dozen into the van. The other 100 will go to the prison kitchens. You will have an extra 250 dozen eggs. Tom! Sell them by undercutting the competition by a few pence per dozen, and you should clear over a hundred pounds per day. Well, 700 pounds per week is a respectable income, wouldn't you say, love? <laughs> Makes being in here almost worthwhile. Yes, but Tom, they'll check the van. They had a good look at it when I came in. They won't be interested in counting eggs. But surely they'll see that I'm taking out more eggs than... How you many eggs are there in that stack of trays over there? Well, I don't know. Guess. About 200? They're nearer 400. Well, it's difficult when that's exactly like that. It's difficult to estimate, which is why, my love, if I play our cards right, you and I ought to make around 50,000 pounds over the next 18 months that the birds will be in lay. <sighs> Enough to see that you're okay with a bit spare for expenses. Tom, it all sounds terribly risky. I mean, robbing a prison. Well, I don't suppose it's ever been done before. <laughs> An inside job. <laughs> What expenses, Tom? Dealing with his honour, Judge Edward Dawlish, won't be cheap. Oh! Oh! Some horse, eh, boy? Oh, he's magnificent, Dad. Beautiful. I'll tell you something. He slowed up in the dip between top field and the meadow where the drainage is bad. Rubbish, boy. He can hold his stride through an Irish bog. Can't you, my beauty? Uh, it wasn't much. He's out of Indy Star. That's right. And Rock Hardy. And both of them used to slow up badly, even after a light fall of rain before the meeting. You remember that anti-post bet on close encounter I talked you into last year? Ooh, Sixty to one. <laughs> Could do with a few more lucky tips like that, eh, boy? What do you mean that wasn't lucky? I knew damn well that Rock Hardy would flag halfway through the court. <laughs> I know the headmaster of one of the local schools. Boys have got a rain gauge set up. He keeps me posted. I can usually make a pretty good guess as to the state of the water table on the course just before a meeting. You go to that trouble? Sure. Oh, now, don't you start that. Start what, boy? I wish you wouldn't call me that. <laughs> Not dignified for a judge, eh, boy? It can't be any worse than gambling. Dad, I don't gamble. Well, not much, anyway. So why are you so sensitive about it? I... I am not sensitive about it. About what? My gambling. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Just as well your father-in-law made you a judge if you were as easy to trip up as that when you were a barrister. How is the noble lord, by the way? Well, Caroline? So, so. How come you didn't ask earlier? For the same reason I didn't ask you why she's not come down with you. Because she doesn't approve of me. No one approves of you, Ben Dawlish. If you ever come up before me, I'd consider it my duty to shove you away for at least 20 years. Even if a skilled counsel, by some miracle of the judicial process, managed to prove you innocent. <laughs> I said. What's the matter? Just look at that sunset. Isn't that something? It happens every night, just before dusk. Strange, isn't it? How a chance event can suddenly unleash a, a flood of childhood memories. You remember Appledore? Yes. I used to ride him up to this ridge in the summer. Just to look at the sunset. Poor old Appledore. God. If only I hadn't pushed him at that wall. It was just along here, wasn't it? Hmm. Huh? Yes, it was. It was... It was just here. I, re I remember this oak. And that slight rise just before the wall. I remember thinking 
And if I am Dumbledore, that... You remember? Why, yes. Yes, it's a, it's a bit hazy, but... But you could never remember anything afterwards. The doctor and your mother said that it was probably a good thing. I remember saying to Appledore that we could gallop towards the sunset, ignoring all obstacles, just like a steeplechase. It would be a ride that went on forever and ever. And ever. You rode Appledore at obstacles on that evening? Oh, yeah. Into the sunset? But I thought you knew. It was an hour after sunset when your mother and I found you. As it's a low war, we thought that Appledore had been up to his old tricks again, and deliberately thrown you. Uh, it wasn't his fault. I think I always knew that. No, I hadn't forgotten it. It's just that I didn't want to believe it was my fault, and somehow my brain contrived to make me forget. Anyway, it was so many years ago. I had to shoot Appledore. Yes, I know, Dad. Let's forget it. I'm sorry I brought the subject up. He hadn't broken a leg. The following morning, while your mother stayed with you at the hospital, I went out looking for him, because he wasn't with you. But when I came home... You, you were nearly me? a year in hospital. That morning, I went out looking for him with the 2-2. Two -two. He was grazing down by the stream. Not a scratch on him. I think he knew why I was carrying the rifle. It was the first and last time that I ever had to shoot a horse. Except that I didn't have to shoot him. Dad, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know. As you say, best forgotten, eh? <laughs> come on, boy. Let's see what we can find in the freezer for dinner. Yeah. Pity Caroline didn't come down. I was looking forward to a weekend of decent cooking. <laughs> Not bad, eh, boy? Mm. Oh, do stop calling me that, Dad. I have a master chef's touch when it comes to throwing out a dinner. You ever thought of marrying again? Nope. But there's a new stable girl, an Australian, who has it on her mind. More plump. An Australian stable girl? <laughs> you should see your face. I can tell exactly what's going through your mind. <laughs> How the devil do I explain this to Caroline? Eh? <laughs> yeah, I rather imagine she would put it <laughs> Flip, flip. <yeah. laughs> hmm. Is there a girl? Or a woman, as it ought to be at your age? Nope. Let's open another bottle. Oh, uh, well. Uh... Marvellous stuff. You know, boy... I often wonder why you went to up and marry such a snob as Caroline. Oh, Caroline's form of snobbery is pretty inoffensive. Mm, maybe. She's done your career good, I'll give her that. Meaning I've no ability of my own. Well, she hasn't done any harm, has she? Daughter of the Lord Chancellor and all that? Must <laughs> count for something. Your mother would be pleased. She wanted you to make it more than anything else in the world. Now there was a real snob. Mother? Remember that team of brewers' drays we used to stable? No, maybe you don't. Frightful row about that, your mother and me had. Lasted a week. <laughs> she damn near left me. I had no idea. Oh, I always told the line in the end. <laughs> I bet. I did, boy. You damn well bet your life I did. If I didn't, it meant that I'd lose the two things that meant more to me than anything else in the world. Her and you. But you were happy. We both loved one another in our different ways. But you were the knife she held pointed at my throat. You know, boy, you can go happily through life with a knife at your throat. Well, you can do just about everything. But don't make a sudden move. I think you're a little drunk, Dad. It was her who wanted you to go into law. It was her who got you that pupillage in Sir Clancy's chamber. But he was a client of yours. But it was Mary who worked on him. I thought it was you who pushed me into law. I thought you were the driving force. Uh, it was Mary every inch of the way. You knew I wanted to go into the business, Dad. You knew that I wanted nothing else. Oh, do you think I didn't fight her? Queer, isn't it? In stories, the son never wants to follow his father into the family business. I wanted to work with horses. Well, she was right in the long run. Everything's turned out well for you, hasn't it? I wish I knew that. I wish to God I knew. Sit down, Snape. I expect you know what this is about? Uh, yes, sir. I've just had a phone call from the Home Office. The appeal judges gave their verdict 30 minutes ago. In the light of the evidence supplied by the Inland Revenue as a result of their investigation into the affairs of Harold Slope, your sentence has been reduced by four and a half years. Four? Four? Years and six months. Exactly half of your original sentence. And you'll be hearing from your legal advisors tomorrow, of course. I thought you'd like to hear right away. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. 
Seems that their lordships are satisfied you have gambled away the money you embezzled from your employers and that you haven't got a large sum sorted away. <laughs> I just can't believe it, sir. I should have the confirmation tomorrow. So now I'll be able to apply to the parole board after... After, after uh... you've served a third of your sentence, 18 months. You've already served three months. So carry on as you have been. I'll give you a strong recommendation for release on license. You should be a free man within 15 months. You're being stupid. Read what the appeal judges said. Go on, read it again and tell me where there's any criticism of you, either implied or direct, on the way that you handle Snape's file. There's nothing, is there? Halving a sentence? That doesn't have to be. The Inland Revenue's raid on Slope's house produced evidence that wasn't available at the time of Snape's trial. So please, in the name of God, tell me how any blame can be steered at you. And supposing the Inland Revenue hadn't decided to investigate Slope, what then? Huh? Well, what it's then? obvious that they decided to take a look at him because of the trial. You think so? It's obvious that that's what's happened. Mm, but supposing they hadn't? A miscarriage of justice would have taken place perpetrated by me. Which didn't happen. Which might have. Oh, we're just going round in circles. Oh, should have. Oh, should. You're not resigning, Edward. You're too far up the ladder to go chucking yourself off because of a ridiculous misplaced delusion that you're not capable of remaining a judge. You quit, and so do I. Because you like being married to a judge. Because you'll be throwing both our lives away. Oh, as we haven't any children, I've sunk everything. My love, my dreams, ambition, everything into you. Nearly 20 years. Oh, and you want to throw it all away. Oh, sorry, my darling. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Please forgive me. I didn't think. Shh. You, you won't resign, will you, Edward? Oh, oh, promise me you won't. Of course I won't. And, and you'll tear up the letter to Daddy. So I'll do it right now. It's good of you to come and see me, Miss Jarvis. Well, I could hardly refuse a judicial summons, Judge. No, it's not quite that. You led the Inland Revenue team that investigated Harold Slope, the bookmaker. Yes. Well, you don't have to answer these questions, but I'd be most grateful if you did. And I assure you that I won't disclose anything you tell me. What do you want to know? Did you decide to investigate Slope because of the Snaith trial? No. You look surprised. And why did you investigate him? I'm in charge of a small team that visits inspector of taxes offices throughout the country. The local inspector gives us a list of names he's not happy about, but hasn't the resources to deal with, and we put the names in a hat and pull out one or two to receive the full treatment. You pick the names out of a hat? We can put suspected evaders under a 24-hour surveillance, tap their phones if we can prove it's justified, even raid homes and offices. Yes, yes, yes. I know all about your powers, but out of a hat. Well, a slight exaggeration there, Judge. Actually, we type up a list and stick a pin in it. Is anything wrong? Well, that's interesting, Foxy. What's that score? Did you know the Lord Chancellor is eighth in precedence for the throne? Told you he was big, didn't I? He presides over the House of Lords and has a vote and is a member of the Cabinet. Sure. He's head of the Land Register, the Public Record Office, and he's the Public Trustee, custodian of the Great Seal. Head of the Chancellor Division, <laughs> President of the Supreme Court. He got the list is endless. All them jobs, but I can't cope with a few egg trays. And don't drop any more. Uh, a circuit judge can be dismissed by the Lord Chancellor, but the dismissal of a High Court judge is a more complex procedure involving an address by both Houses of Parliament. You don't suppose Edward Dawlish is a High Court judge, do you, Foxy? Oh, you're not going on about Crawley. What's the point? You've got your sentence on. Be thankful for that, I say. You've got another two weeks, Foxy. That's right. What will you do? Don't know, Squire. Social Security and a lucky horse now and then. And you'll get into debt, right, and you'll pinch a car? Yeah. And you'll be back in here? I reckon this is the last time I'll see Tom Mill Squire finding another car. You know, when I first started knocking off cars, the Lord leave you alone. We was reckoned harmless. Now, with the price of cars gone mad, you're in trouble. Look at that Range Rover. 12,000 quid they valued it at with extras. Serious crime league, that is. 
Well, it's gone right round the twist. Sure. <laughs> I'd like a job, Squire. Straight up, I would. But who'd have me? You can drive. Of course I can drive. Who ever heard of a car thief who couldn't drive? Ask Miss Parsons if she'd give you a job. What? Her that collects the eggs? She looks as though she could do with some help. Why don't you ask? Oh, I would like to, Squire. Work for a woman. Would you like me to ask her for you? Oh. Oh. Well, yeah. Oh, thanks a lot, Squire. Six thousand clear on the nine-week period, but that's fantastic, Marion. You agree the figures? You've not missed a penny. Oh, nine weeks. It seems more like nine years. You've no idea how tiring it is. Oh, I can understand, love. You have done a marvellous job. I don't think I'll be able to keep it up, Tom. I've arranged for you to have some help. Fox is leaving in two weeks. He needs a job. Foxy? You mean he knows what's going on? No, and even if he did, I don't think it would matter. There's a curious camaraderie among the criminal fraternity. They've stepped outside society's rules, so they've had to make their own. I could certainly use the help. Yes, so could I. How? As you're far too busy providing the finance for the plan, I'll be able to make use of Fox's talents to put it into operation. Safe! Hey. Sir? Morning. Morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Just the fellow I wanted to see. Tell me, in your company's secretary days, did you ever negotiate the purchase of machinery? Well, yes, sir, quite often. Oh, splendid. I've got a little job for you. It means a trip out with Mr. Brunt to take a look at a couple of second-hand Fords and tractors. Now, if Mr. Brunt says they're okay, see if you can beat the price down. He's not very good at that sort of thing. I'd be pleased to help, sir. Splendid. Uh, where exactly are these tractors? Downey Racecourse. I thought racing meant a comfortable seat in the grandstand of a white jacket waiter to serve in champagne. <laughs> That's not racing. Down here is racing. Damn shooting stick. How do you manage to get comfortable on the blasted thing? Oh, it takes years of practice. Which you've had, I suppose. Don't you like racing, sir? No, it is. Especially down here among the bookies and the rousmatars. Sordid. Then why did you insist on coming with me? Did Caroline put you up to it to see that I didn't bet too heavily? Huh? Oh, no. Curious task, the Lord Chancellor. She wants me to have a little chat with her. Ah. Yes. Uh, Elda! Oh, oh, you a great dead old boy. Great death. Yes, you backed Ogden in the first race. Twenty on the nose at 33 to 1. Yes. <laughs> More than one. Mm. <laughs> Did what you said. Always follow the cattle's advice. Uh, yes, yes. Save the synthetic right, one. Uh, yes, good. Now, if you'll just excuse me. Who's your friend, old boy? I thought you were a loner. No. Careful. Yes, I must get a bet on for the next race. Stick with the cattle. Who is the cattle? Uh, oh, uh, he writes a racing column in the Perth uh, Tokyo. Is he good? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, how should I know? I don't bet that much. Sorry. Didn't mean to go prodding now. They're coming out. Can I have the binoculars a minute? Oh, uh, Sure. Thanks. Yes. The uh, barn dance looks very good. Number seven. What's the matter? What did he say? He thinks Edward's been under a strain lately. He's asleep now. Did he say what it was he saw? I didn't ask him. Must have been something pretty extraordinary to make him pass out like that. Grown men don't kill over in a dead faint without reason. And he said snake just before he passed out. That's what it sounded like. Snake? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Mm. Oh, I've been so worried about him, Dad. He's been miserable and hardly eating. He snaps my head off if I as much as open my mouth. Everything I do... Maybe to... he needs a break. I'd never get him to take a holiday. I wasn't thinking of that. The president of the Wotan B Nuclear Power Station Inquiry hasn't been nominated yet. All the signs are that it's going to be a major battle spread over the best part of 18 months. The anti-fast breeder brigade are amassing their forces and all the Queen's men are amassing theirs. It would take Edward out of the courtroom for a few months. And put him in the public eye? Smack in the middle of the pupil, my girl. Will it enhance his career? 
If he handles it well, I'd make a shrewd guess that it'll bring his appointment to the High Court forward by about two years. And that will put him firmly on course to make Lord Chief Justice, yes? I don't appoint the Lord Chief Justice, Caroline. But the younger he is when he makes the High Court... I'd like that, Daddy. <laughs> Scheming little mix. <laughs> I said that there hasn't been a nomination yet. You'll fix it, won't you? I'll have a word with the Energy Secretary in the morning. But I want you to understand that I'm putting Edward's name forward because I think he's the best man for the job. Of course, Daddy. I'll agree to understand that. It's getting to be so much money, Tom. It's frightening me. There's nothing to worry about, love. Everything's going just like I said, isn't it? In nine months, we've made nearly 30,000. If we hadn't made that sort of money, then you'd have the right to worry. Uh, yes, I suppose so, but... Well, what happens when you're released and they discover that the chickens are laying 5,000 eggs a day? In four weeks before my release date, I'll drastically reduce the birds' food and water. That'll bring on a premature moat and egg production will be back to what it was when I took charge of the battery house. Don't you think I'm clever? <laughs> yes, Tom. How's Foxy getting on? I don't know how I managed without him. Don't get too dependent on him. I'll be needing him soon. Six months, Marion. Mm, I just can't wait. It's still a dream. I used to cry myself to sleep every night when I thought I was losing you for six years. And now, well, I see you every day and we'll be back together soon. And we've money in the bank. I know, love, I know. And I couldn't have done any of this without you. Did you bring the scrapbook? Yes. It... But, Tom, you don't want me to keep it up anymore, do you? Of course I do. Following Edward Dawlish's career is my favorite occupation. It all seems so. So pointless now, Tom. I mean, your sentence has been cut. Through a stroke of luck which in no way mitigates Dawlish's behavior. What about all the other juries he swayed? And women waiting, as you might have had to wait, for husbands he's unjustly sentenced. Oh, the, the cuttings agent sent this one this morning. I've not had time to stick it in. He's to preside over the Wotanby nuclear power station inquiry. Now, that is interesting. Why? It'll last several months. Which means that he'll be in the same place all the time. No, Mr. Simons, I can't have you introducing such evidence during the first week. Now, as I said this morning, we'll spend week one of this inquiry examining the need by the country for the vote and be power station. Parliament has given us such terms of reference, so let us enjoy them. And besides, Besides, justifying the escape of radioactive iodine from Wotan A on the grounds that it was a small leakage reminds me of the story of the unmarried mother who tried to justify her illegitimate baby on the grounds that it was a very small baby. <laughs> but it's gone mine, Edward. Where on earth have you been? Drinking, my precious. Having a few drinks with the protagonists from both sides. No, Amazing what a few beers can do. I even saw an industrialist buy a Friends of the Earth campaign or a drink. Oh, didn't it occur to you that I'd like to hear how the first day went? A smooth day silk, the day But you never drink with the participants. Ah, it's not a trial. Turn up the sound, will you? It's quite earlier forebodings. The demonstrations outside the Newlands Conference Hall, where the inquiry is being held, were orderly and quiet. Yeah. Jonathan Lewis sent us this report. Already at Newlands, the shopkeepers are taking down the boards they nailed across their windows, but the expected trouble simply never happened. When the inquiry opened on the stroke of ten this morning, Judge Edward Dawlish said that he was to be called Mr. Dawlish or just plain sir. His easygoing manner, sometimes telling jokes, has done much to ease the background tension, and already he is being referred to as Edward the Peacemaker. Mm -hmm. Only mm -hmm. time will tell if His Honor Judge Edward Dawlish will be able to keep the peace in the long months ahead of the inquiry. Uh, on the industrial. Well. I think they're laying it on a bit thick. Well, I think it's marvelous. But why on earth do you insist on undermining your position by saying you're to be addressed as Mr. or Sir? Well, darling, you don't understand the luxury of not being a judge. See, I, I'm going to enjoy this inquiry. People are treating me as a human being, asking me to have a drink with them. Oh. And when it's over, I don't have to make the final decision. All I have to do is assemble the evidence for the politicians. I won't even have to send anyone to prison. I've been a prison governor for 20 years now, Snaith, and had more than my fair share of frustration, but 
But now and again, a prisoner passes through my hands who seems to make everything worthwhile. You've been one of those prisoners. Thank you, sir. Have you made plans? I might go into poultry farming, sir. Oh, well. well we've not made much out of it, even with your increased production. I'm sorry that your wife never came to see you in all these months. Oh, yes, sir. Hmm. Well, the very best of luck to you, Slate. And do read the terms of your license. We don't want you recalled to serve the rest of your sentence. But that won't happen, sir. I promise. <laughs> and then he said, I'm sorry your wife hasn't been to see you in all these months. <laughs> I don't know how you had the nerve, Squire. Straight up, I don't. Oh, them eggs. But what about me, Foxy? I was the one who had to drive in and out every day. <laughs> you could have not knocked me down with a feather. You mm. two, man and wife. <laughs> I uh, expect you made a bit, eh? Not as much as we could have made if I hadn't been paroled. <laughs> <laughs> but enough for immediate expenses, plus a little over. Um, I suppose you'll close the market stall now? No, it's yours now, Foxy. What? Marion's gradually switched over to bona fide suppliers, and it's showing a comfortable profit. The van's yours as well. The stall? Mine? But I couldn't pay you. The stock must uh, be... It's all yours, Foxy. Marion and I don't want to be bothered with it. Right. I don't know how to thank you, sir, Mr. Snape. If there's anything I can do... Yes, Foxy. There is something you can do. But surely, Daddy, if the criminal division is below strength, why can't you give a definite date? I'd rather wait until the inquiry's over. It's a matter of a few more weeks, and then Edward will have the thankless task of preparing his report. Announcing his promotion at this stage could be construed as a form of subtle governmental pressure on Edward to influence his recommendations. Hmm. He seems to be very up well under the strain. He's enjoying every minute of it. The greater the pressure, the more he likes it. Quite a social gathering every night in the pub near the conference hall. To give him his due, he's taken the heat out of the disputes between all the factions. I know why you're holding back. You're waiting to see if he manages to complete the inquiry without trouble, yes? Please, Caroline, let's wait until it's over. Hmm? And, uh, the last one is Cheltenham on the 10th. He bet a fibre and lost it. Hmm, so that Sandown part the week before, Goodwood before that. Quite the keen race girl is our judge. More than that, Mr. Snaith. Um, I wasn't sure what you'd say about these expenses I've run up. I gave him a free hand, Foxy. I said stick to him 24 hours a day. He's been to Paris two Sundays running. I couldn't follow him the first time because I didn't have any passport with me. I stayed with him last Sunday. Paris? But he also raced Place just outside Paris. Frog cabs cost a fortune. Chance, on it? Chantilly? That's the place. Well, well, well. The French are now Sunday racing. i tell you something, Foxy. He's more than a keen race goer. He's an obsessive gambler. <laughs> That's what the psychiatrist said about me when I was on remand. <laughs> Looks as though we found Edward Dawlish's Achilles heel. A moment of truth, love. You'll never give up, will you? Never. Hello? I'm terribly sorry to trouble you on a Sunday, but this is the clerk to the justices at Wyvern Cross. Uh, could I have a quick word with the judge, please? Oh, he's not. Could you tell me where I could get hold of him, please? It is important. Ah, his father's stub farm. And the number? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. That was probably his wife. She thinks her beloved husband has gone down to see his father. Hello? They're calling his flight now. 
Now, well done, Foxy. You can come home. We've got him, Marion. We've got the bastard cold. He will look tired. Oh, every man in his car was on the road. Mm, this is good. It's the late film in a few minutes, darling. She'll be watching. How's your father? Oh, he's fine. Why? What's the matter? He's still riding? Well, yes, of course. You don't approve of Dad. It's unusual for you to show an interest in him. There's other things I don't approve of. What? Lying, for example. I forced open the drawer in your desk two hours ago. You... I found these. Several London Paris airline ticket stubs, racing cards for Longchamp, Maison Lafitte and Chanty, and a bank statement for your number two account. Uh, I, I suppose if I were to pass some cutting comment about your breaking into my writing desk, you'd get hysterical. Quite possibly. All those Sundays when you said you were going to see your father, you went racing in France. Not all of them. And last year? About four times. That's in addition to all the meetings you attend in this country. Does it matter? Does your career matter? My career? I wasn't aware that it was my career. I always thought it was something owned jointly by you and your father. When I think of all the lies and deceit over the past... Darling, I've never made a secret of my gambling. Only the level. I have hurt no one. I have not even lost money. That bank account has always been in the black. Oh, I'm too tired to argue. And besides... Your that's... pride has been hurt. <sighs> yes, it, it was cowardly of me not to tell you. It, well, it's just that lying gradually became easier and easier. I think that's why I've learned to understand the habitual criminal. And now find it impossible to condemn others for their weaknesses. I knew you were bound to find out eventually. All it needed was for Dad to ring up one Sunday. Did he call today? It's not only my pride, Edward. I've had to sit here all the evening wondering how to tell you and not being able to. Because I've been the one made to feel guilty. I don't understand. I've had two phone calls. One early this morning from the Wyvern Clark. Yeah. And one, two hours ago, from one of your father's stable lads. Ben was thrown from a horse and fractured his skull. Oh, no. I must get down there. <laughs> right away. It's too late, Edward. Your father died on the way to hospital. <laughs> You're bitter, Mr. Rogers. Oh, thank you, friend. Mm. Mm. Well, what's that stuff? A dreadful capitalist drink, Mr. Rudge. So tell me why your what's-the-name party is opposed to the power station. The WSRP, friend. For every nuclear power station built, 3,000 miners' jobs are lost. Jobs that will have to be reinstated to the workers at the end of the century when the uranium and oil runs out. It is the duty of the WSRP to alert the proletariat to the creeping oppression of... Your the... alerting seems to have fizzled out in the case of the working bee pastor. Because Judge Dawlish said he would allow us to speak at the inquiry, to advance a rational argument. Which you didn't have. Which we didn't have prepared. The WSRP is a direct action party. We believe in direct action by our members to achieve direct action by the government. Our arguments are carried on our placards and banners. Direct action is a process understood by the masses and sought after by the media. You mean street rioting, Mr. Rudge? Orderly demonstrations, Mr. Snay. Which cost money. Our active members are spread throughout the country spreading the message. To get them together in one place would cost money. Their fares have to be paid. What sort of orderly demonstration outside the inquiry hall would 5,000 pounds buy me? <laughs> Here's the best one. Judge Dawlish refused to comment on the demonstration against him organized by the WSRP, but it was obvious that the events outside the conference hall, including his car being spat on, had shaken him badly. 
It's not clear why the judge, whose handling of the inquiry so far commanded wide respect, should have suddenly aroused the ire of the WSRP. Was it necessary to spit on his car? Excitement tends to carry people away. Pity the police didn't carry a few of them away. Oh, they probably will when we get into our stride. You'll, uh, have to provide a fund to pay my members fines if you want us to step up the campaign, Mr. Snaith. There'll be money available, Mr. Well, I think how hard I had to work to earn it. Uh, for Tuesday, tomorrow, mm -hmm. I want the demonstration kept at the same level as today. Right. Uh, the same for Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Thursday, he'll be at his father's funeral, so you can give your lads the day off. Right. Will they have the banners ready by Friday? Yes. This is my design for the main one. Blue lettering on the yellow background. That's the combination that shows up best on colour televisions. Red lettering shows up blurred. Overscan, they call it. Don't let a gambler gamble with our future. Dawlish is a born loser. Health warning. Every government judge carries a packet. I like that one. Uh, what about public address equipment? Just one loud hailer. That's all we need. Too many people with loud hailers prevent the film sound recordist getting a clean recording. Now I can adjust the output so that it's just right for any conditions. A Friday morning is a good time for major demos. Gives the Sunday papers a chance to put their oar in. You do know your subject, right? Dawes will go home Friday evening a sick man. He'll have all weekend to ponder, worrying that there'll be a repetition Monday morning. And then he'll resign. To Friday morning, then? Sorry, Judge, but look at it. There's no way that this car is going to get to the conference hall. Uh, take the second on the left. No, wait. Inspector Wallace, it is your responsibility to get me into that hall. I'm also responsible for your safety and worried about mine. So let's be realistic, Judge. Oh, they've spotted us. Ow! Get this car moving, you clown. of your being required to resign, or being allowed to, for that matter, do you think we would tolerate a situation in which any group of political activists can undermine the judiciary with cant, invective, and street violence? I've enjoyed the inquiry. Up to now, that is. It seems to me that the judiciary wouldn't be undermined if it wasn't called upon to administer inquiries relating to sensitive political issues. I seem to remember that the ringleaders weren't so much interested in politics as the fact that you have an interest in horses. But that, that's common knowledge. Which isn't the same as public knowledge, nor is it likely to be. The ringleaders haven't produced a shred of evidence. Meaning your attitude would be different if they had? A hypothetical question, Edwin. Which earned a politician's answer. <laughs> How are the bruises? Going down. What are you going to do about your father's stud farm? Well, a senior stable lad's looking after things at the moment. I'd like to advertise for a manager. Caroline wants me to sell it. Uh, she's right, of course. Why? I think you know the answer to that. My father put his life into that stud. One life is enough for any business to claim. Now, have you looked at the morning papers yet? Yeah, I saw a picture of myself being helped out of an overturned car. That was quite enough. The same letter has appeared in all editions. The writer wonders whether it is right that known gamblers should hold high office in government and be involved in decision-making in affairs known to be attracting heavy betting. Huh? No names, just innuendo. I'm Mr. Wayne, huh? Look after yourself, Edward. Yes. And remember what I said. It seems that someone is conducting a vendetta against you. Snaith. All right, you've made your point. You've got the inquiry suspended for a few days, you've given him a bad sprite, and you had your letter in all yesterday's newspapers. So why not leave him alone now? His pride's taken a knock, but it's not enough. Well, that's what you'll have to be satisfied with. There's nothing in today's papers and nothing on the news. It is not going to become the big issue that you thought it was. I need evidence, something positive. But even if you found it, what harm could you do him? He's the son-in-law of the Lord Chancellor. They look after their own. That's where you're wrong. If one of their number falls, they'll abandon him to the wolves without giving him a second thought. And the fact that he's Lord Carthage's son-in-law makes him that much more vulnerable. All I need is something concrete. Oh. 
I used to ride up here as a boy. Just look at it, Caroline. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, it's beautiful as this damned horse is ugly. Oh, and uncomfortable. Oh, tell you, you moth-eaten ruminant. Oh, wretched beast keeps twitching. He probably senses that you can't stand horses. Just look at that sunset. Do you still think my reserve is too high? Oh, you're impossible, Edward. You're selling the stud farm, not the sunset. I'll persuade the auctioneer to throw them in for nothing. You are in good spirits. But aren't I always when I made up my mind? No regrets? Of course not. Besides, the money will come in useful when it sells. We'll buy a villa on the med. If it sells. Why do you put such a high reserve price on it? Come on. I'll wreck you back. Oh, oh, get on, you wretched beast. Go on, get on. Come on. Hello, this is Edward Dawlish. I'd like to place a bet, a large one. Do you want my code? Yes, 49D2000. 3.30. Sand Lizard. What odds can you give me for £10,000 to win? Yes, that's right. £10,000. All in, run or not. Will you take it? Uh, yes, 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 I'll be by the phone. Thank you. Jungle where dreams may wait in my mind's eye, a vivid terrain with every heartbeat, a story unfurls in the realm of daydreams when magic swirls. With the daydreamers Soaring all day long Heart believers Singing our own songs Painting sky Marching to Good luck Dolish Good morning, Mr. Byrne uh, yeah, you've heard about my spectacular bet, then? Yes, of course I know what I'm doing. Ten thousand pounds on Sand Lizard. Mr. Byrne, I assure you that I know what I'm doing. Better than you may realize. Yes, that's agreed. Settlement within 72 hours. Well, that's hardly a polite question, Mr. Byrne, but yes, I do have adequate funds, should I lose. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Good day. Well, Edward, you've done it. No turning back now. Who's that one from? The auctioneers. Show me. Hmm. And in conclusion, we feel that your reserve price is unrealistic at the present time and strongly urge you to revise it if you still require us to achieve a sale. Well, you want to sell the farm, don't you? Oh, yes, of course I do. It's just that I've no intention of giving it away. I'll find another firm of auctioneers. Well, you've already had to. Mm, what? Dad put his life into that stud. Which you can't expect a buyer to pay for. Oh, it'll go eventually. You know, my, my clerk was telling me yesterday how Arabs are buying up every acre they can lay their hands on. Mm, it's nice having you back in court. Mm. Didn't you ever get fed up with that inquiry just a tiny bit? No, no. No, not even during the difficult time. Aren't you going to open the other letter? Craven Crook and Heritage, Commissioners for Oves. It's no good you're trying to hide it. I can read the envelope upside down. That must be the tenth letter that firm has sent you. Are we suing someone? No, oh, it's just some law reform issue that one of their partners feels strongly about. Oh, I'll get my clerk to deal with that. Oh, I'll see to it, love. Make sure you've got all the touring maps together, right? Okay, darling. Yes? Oh. Oh. Good morning, Mrs. Lee. I remember your face when your husband's child. Paul? To show him in, love. Well, Smith, this makes a pleasant change meeting you on your territory. May I sit down? Thank you. 
<sighs> Packing? You can't be thinking of going abroad. They should be holding your passport while you're on parole. What do you want? Just as I thought. What do you want? You're a coward, aren't you, Snaith? Huh? Easy enough to conduct a vendetta against someone through intermediaries and letters to the papers. Quite a different matter when you meet them face to face. Uh, that's all over. Shut up. What? So you admit there was a vendetta. It's hard to know he hasn't got a tape recorder in that briefcase. <laughs> Such an idea never occurred to me, Snaith. Uh, but then it wouldn't. I haven't got your evil, devious little mind. And besides, it would be better if there's no record of what I have to say to you. Now, wait, just wait a minute. It's, it's all over now. I've talked Tom out of it. Will you I... shut up? I'm just telling you. And I'm telling you to keep your stupid mouth shut. People oh. with manners would never dream of having squalid little arguments in front of strangers. I'm glad I came to see you, Snaith. Firstly, I want to tell you that your filthy little hate campaign against me has failed abysmally. Because I am to be appointed to the High Court in the new year. Oh. And secondly, I wanted to see for myself the sort of stone you and your cheap tart of a wife choose to live under. And thirdly, I wanted to tell you that if I had my way, you would still be rotting in prison. I also want you to know that at no time did your malicious, cheap stunts ever cause me a moment's concern. Nothing you did in the past hurt me, and nothing you're planning for the future can hurt me. <clears throat> Good day to you both. I hope it rains every day of your holiday. I'll see myself, huh? It means a few priceless seconds less in your contemptible company. You heard what he called me. Did you hear what he called me? He's left his briefcase on the chair. Who cares about his briefcase? What are we going to do about the name that he called I me? I saw him looking at the chair before he left the room. And it's unlocked. There are letters in here. You know, it's as if he left it here deliberately. Sit down, Edward. I expect you know why I've summoned you. Uh, yeah, I think I can uh, guess, my lord. Of course, this is a disgusting little magazine, but it does have the reputation of being remarkably well informed. I have seen it before, my lord. This issue? Yes. They've taken a risk, of course, but risk-taking has built their circulation. That's what the editor told me yesterday afternoon. He sat in that chair and assured me that he'd seen the original letters and that they had been used to make their offset litho plates. He said that there's no question of the letters being forgeries. The solicitors whose notepaper they appear on have refused to comment at this stage. Uh, they're not genuine. Then you are being sued for the recovery of gambling debts amounting to... Ten thousand pounds? Yes, my lord. How did the letters fall into the editor's hands? I went to see Snaith last week and left my briefcase at his house. He returned it two days later. The lock had been forced? It wasn't locked. Caroline wants me to pay this debt. That is something I cannot do under any circumstances. Well, I wouldn't expect anyone to. She tells me that you have sufficient funds. Yes. Then for God's sake, Van White, the devil, don't you pay it. Where is Caroline, my lord? She doesn't want to see you. She's worked hard to help you get where you are, you know. Yes. Do you intend repaying this debt before the date set for the hearing? I've had two letters typed. The first one is from you to the solicitors. It says that you are settling the account with your bookmaker by return. A messenger can deliver the letter within the hour so that the senior partner can stop the action against you. The second letter is your resignation. It's for you to decide which one you wish to sign. <sighs> there it is, Jimmy. Just look at that. What do you think of that one, eh? That's the best sunset yet. Uh, beautiful, Jack. I mean, uh, Mr. Darling. Uh, you nearly slipped up then, Jimmy boy. Ah, uh, come on then. We'd better get these two into the stables. Why do we do this every evening, Mr. Darling? Huh? Right up here and look at the sunset. Uh, I thought you'd have got tired after a week, but it's been three months now. Ever since you took over. Because, Jimmy, because, 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 because. <laughs> I could start explaining now and we'd still be here for the sunrise. 
Home, James. Oh, that's what your dad used to say, Mr. Dolly. Were you happy working for him? Oh, yes. How about me? You happy working for me? I think so, Mr. Dolly. And you? I'll tell you something, Jimmy. For the first time in my life, I'm master of my own destiny. I... Does that sound terribly pompous? Oh, no, sir. Well, what if it does? I can't think of a better way of putting it. But I miss my wife. God, how I miss her. Come on. Place you back. All right. That's funny, Mr. Dolish. There's a light on in the kitchen. Not only that, there's someone in there. Cooking. Caroline. You are silly leaving the place unlocked, Edward. Anybody could walk in. It just says the silly things you do when I'm not around to keep an eye on you. Jimmy, yes, sir? Go and make sure we locked the stables properly. But we did, sir. Okay. You know, I can't think of what to say. It's a marvellous stove in here. Does it stay hot all the time? Uh, uh, oh, yes. Um, it's the original cooking range, not what you're used to. You look well. And um, you look, well, as beautiful as always. I think I understand now why you did what you did. Why now? You haven't answered any of my letters. Well, Daddy and I had tea out this afternoon. He, he told me about the two unsigned letters he placed before you and how you signed both of them. It was then that I realized. Oh, that was naughty signing both of them, Edward. You know how Daddy has a politician's taste for <laughs> melodrama. <laughs> You'd better come in out of the cold and show me how this stove works. <laughs> In Vendetta for a Judge by James Follett, Edward Dawlish was played by Bernard Horsfall and Caroline by Mary Law. Tom Snaith, Roger Hammond.